You are listening to The Overwhelmed Brain. If social anxiety is preventing you from experiencing the life you want, get the powerful safe system for social anxiety at quietbegins.com. Launches March 31st, 2019. Life presents the toughest challenges. Every day you are faced with decisions that test your ability to express who you really want to be in this world. We're told to keep saying affirmations and keep thinking positively, but what do you do when that stuff doesn't work? Welcome to The Overwhelmed Brain, where you'll learn to make decisions that are right for you so that you can create the life you want now. Hello and welcome to the show. My name is Paul Coliani and I'm here to help you increase your emotional intelligence so that you can stay out of dysfunction and toxic situations and also show up as your authentic self. Everything I talk about on this show is my personal opinion and is meant for informational and educational purposes only. Always consult a medical or psychological professional before making any changes that could affect your physical or mental health. So I had a conversation the other day with someone regarding a high school reunion. And I noticed that um, some people are organizing my high school reunion uh, like 30 years ago. And I honestly don't think any of those people listen to this show. And I know I've talked about some of the people in high school that really bothered me. And I, I do wonder if they listen or tune into this show. Eventually they may hear this show and uh, think, what, why is Paul talking about me? Well, the people I talk about, they may or may not be the same people that they were in high school. So when I talk about these people, I'm talking about the experience I had then. I'm putting out that little disclaimer just in case anyone tunes in and says, what? That's not who I am. Well, (laughs) this is the experience I had then. So uh, when you hear about you, if you're listening and you went to high school with me, uh, if you're a different person, awesome. If you're not, then uh, that's not so good. (laughs) At least some of the people, the way they showed up in my life when I was in high school, I don't necessarily want to see those same people again. However, if they've changed, great. It would be great to connect with you again. Um, The reason I'm saying this is because the conversation that I had with some friends had to do with um, this older woman that I know. She has her high school reunion coming up too. And she said, you know, I don't want to see any of those people again. (laughs) And I said, I know exactly what you mean. I know exactly how you feel. Now, there were some people in high school that I wouldn't mind seeing again. I would like to find out how they are. Um, I just haven't really taken the time to look them up or reconnect with them. But there's also another reason. The people, first of all, that are organizing my high school reunion, a lot of them were bullies to me. They made fun of me. They pushed me around. They did things that were not pleasant. And quite frankly, it wasn't so much them showing up that way. They were young and some were very stupid. (laughs) I'm just going to say it. Um, And hopefully they've improved their lives and they're different people. But the most of the people that are in the organizing that are going to be there aren't necessarily people I really want to see again because of those old negative associations. They could be very different people. I don't know. But do I care enough to go, hmm, let me reach out to those people again and see how things are going with them. It just doesn't really interest me. Now, if they reached out to me and said, hey, Paul, remember that time I did this and I'm, you know, I'm not that person anymore. I just wanted to apologize. That might be something different, but I'm not looking for that at all. Uh, In fact, I've healed from a lot of this stuff. Um, It's just, you know, some people you don't really care if you see them again. And so my friend that I was talking to, uh, I said, I I know exactly what you mean. Uh, My high school reunion reunion is being organized right now, and I have no interest in going. I mean, that's kind of sad, I guess, in a way. Like, I have no connections to the past. All my high school friends and not friends and uh, other people that I connected with, you'd think there'd be some small interest or curiosity, but there's not. And I started to say this earlier, but it's not necessarily them. It's me. I know that old excuse, it's not you, it's me. But it's true, it's, it's me. In the sense that when I was in high school and I was being treated in those ways, 
I didn't like who I was back then. Not that I didn't like me, but I didn't like how I showed up at the school. I didn't like how I showed up when I was bullied. I didn't like how I couldn't honor myself or I didn't honor myself or defend myself very well. I didn't like my own behavior. And to revisit that part of my life, those people, brings me back to me 30 years ago. I didn't like myself necessarily back then. I thought I did. You know, I had a good time. I had some good friends. And, you know, I did whatever I could to enjoy my life. And I had a a relationship or two. And I look back now and think the majority of the time, I didn't like who I was. It took me a long time to become someone else that I do like. I don't mean someone else. It was all behavior. I'm still the same person physically. I mean, not necessarily physically. Things have changed and shifted over the years, but I have transformed mentally and emotionally. I have grown into a new space in myself. I feel like I have had a lot of experiences and a lot of challenges and I've gone through a lot of healing and I've gone through a lot of failures and successes that have shaped me into the person that I am today. And I'm really proud of that person that I've become. And I'm, I'm still proud that I'm moving in a good direction because I'm showing up in a way that I, I'll just use the word, should have shown up when I was a teenager, when I was in my early 20s, even beyond. I really wish I could have shown up that way, but I couldn't have. There's, there's no way that we can show up like the person that we are today, that we've grown into today. There's no way. We didn't have the tools. We didn't have the life experience. We didn't have that breakup. We didn't have that job. We didn't get fired. We didn't go through that loss. We didn't get into debt. We didn't, you know, all the successes and failures in our life have shaped who we've become. And there's no way we could have reached into our tool bag and pulled out something useful when we think back into the past and look at the ways we've shown up. Because back then, we were different people. If you're on any type of self-help, personal growth, coaching, therapy, any type of process that improves your mentality, your emotionality, even your physicality sometimes, but all the mind stuff pretty much. If you do anything, any type of learning and growing and healing, you evolve. And because you evolve, you're not that person anymore. You are no longer that person because you have evolved. That can be liberating. And to some people, it might be disappointing. I wish I was that person. I had a different life. I was happier. There, there might have been very positive aspects of that life that you remember. There were positive aspects of the life I remember. And I enjoyed those aspects. I didn't take advantage of some things. I took too much advantage of other things. There were just parts of it that I enjoyed. And those parts I either need to reintroduce into my life if I can or take what I can. (laughs) I mean, you might be at that place where I just need to take what I can and also build new experiences because am I driving forward looking in the rearview mirror all the time? Am I looking behind me wishing today could be the same as it was then? Am I wishing and hoping these nostalgic feelings are going to come back into today and somehow change my life. Most of the time that doesn't happen. I don't think that's ever happened. Well, once or twice it did happen in my life. Like I remember um, when I was 10 years old, I played on this pinball machine in a bowling alley and it was awesome. I'm, I'm speaking from the 10 year old self, although I don't think I use that word, but when I think about it now, it was awesome. It was a, it was a fun machine. And at 10, it was all new and the sounds and the feel, it was just incredible. And then I'm like uh, in my 30s and on eBay, I find that same pinball machine. It was, I mean, it wasn't the same one I played probably, but it was the same model, the same name, and it was broken and it was dirty and I've never owned a pinball machine and I definitely didn't know how to fix one, but I just threw a bit on there just for fun. <laughs> You probably know where I'm going. And uh, that fun bid turned into the winning bid. 
And I then had to pay for the auction, pay for shipping to bring it to my condo at that time and uh, do something with it. So, you know, I won and I was like, oh, crap. (laughs) What do I do now? I don't even know if I could fix this thing. But that nostalgic feeling was strong and I, I, I just wanted that pinball machine again. And so I ended up getting it shipped to my condo and I spent months watching videos, learning more about electronics, soldering circuit boards, and putting the entire thing together. I mean, this thing was a mess. I was repainting it. I was um, heating up plastics and making them flat because they were all curved up from age and heat. And there were so many things involved. It took me a lot of time before I could even turn it on. But the day I turned it on and it lit up and it actually worked was amazing. It was just, it felt so incredible to see this piece of my past in my living room. <laughs> and I I played that thing for, I don't know how many years until I finally sold it. But it was, it was just an amazing feeling. And that connection to my past, it wasn't about just reconnecting with that 10 year old in me. It was about reconnecting with the magic and the mystery and the the novelty and the whole idea of just being with myself and connecting with myself in a way that I could totally enjoy being with me, enjoying who I was, enjoying how I felt with this machine in my hands and how it made me feel at the time. It wasn't as exciting as a 10-year-old learning something new for the first time, but it From the adult perspective, it's a totally different experience, especially when you rebuild it and you know exactly how it works. But it was an amazing learning experience, and it was just a whole new level of excitement and fun. But my point with that is you can't always connect with that nostalgia because you're a different person. When I built this pinball machine, I was a different person. I was not that 10-year-old looking at this machine as if it were some spaceship. I was a 30-something-year-old looking at this rebuilt machine that I had put a lot of time and effort into it and had a lot of pride about and could just be in the moment with it, knowing that I did this. I brought it back to life. It was a different feeling. And so it reminded me that it wasn't the nostalgia I was trying to connect with. It wasn't the old me that I was trying to connect with. It was only the feelings. It was only the emotions. It was only the wonder, the magic that seemed to have been lost or maybe not lost, but I wanted to find more magic in my life. But it's not that I wanted to be 10 years old again. It's not that I wanted to be that child. It's not that I know I could ever be that child. And this is important to understand, at least, you know, in my opinion, when it comes to the person that you used to be, can you honestly say that that's still you? You know, you may have some of the personality quirks and some of the old habits that never went away, or maybe you still have that same sense of humor, or maybe you are completely different. I think there's about, I don't know, 20 to 30% of who I was still in me because I definitely don't want to lose my sense of humor. I definitely don't want to lose my kindness and compassion for others. There's a lot, maybe there's 40%. There's a lot that was in me then that, are, that is still in me now. It's just transformed over the years. Just like there's a lot that's still in you that has been in you, hopefully more positive than negative, but you know, we carry the dysfunction with us too. We carry the old effects of toxic relationships with us. We carry the negativity from dysfunctional upbringing and emotional triggers and sometimes PTSD from more severe negative upbringing, abusive upbringing. And in those cases, it's a lot harder to not be in that space, but that's You know, why you listen to shows like this. That's why you go to therapy. That's why you seek help so that you can get through this stuff so that you can reconnect with the more positive things in life and the more magical and wondrous and curious things in life so that you're not stuck in old past negativity. There was a lot of old negativity in my past and going through that healing process made me realize, oh, I don't necessarily want to be that person in the past. I like this new person I've become, which is leading me to my main point which I've already said in so many words, you are not the person from the past. And that's important for this next segment that I'm going to be talking about this, that when you look at the past, either in you or someone else, 
They are no longer that person. You are no longer that person. You are a different person. Even if 90% of who you were followed you through the years, that 10% can be the biggest difference that makes the difference. That 10% could have been the kid who stole candy from the candy store, and that is definitely not you anymore, I hope. (laughs) Don't steal. (laughs) The, The idea that you could steal a candy bar at this time in life, maybe, you may think that, that's ridiculous, I would never do that. And it could be because you, your morality has changed or maybe now you can afford it so you don't even think about it or it just doesn't occur to you. If you were that kid, you're probably not that kid anymore. In the next segment, I'm going to read portions of an email that has to do with a couple that uh, went through some hard times in their relationship when they were basically children, teenagers, you know, they're still children. They are more mature than, quote, children. And any teenager listening to this now, I'm not saying that you are a child. I'm saying that you have a long way to go that when you finally reach 20s, 30s, 40s, and you look back and you say, wow, I did all this stuff when I was a teenager. Those were kind of childish. Not everyone can say that. Some people are mature for their age. And uh, absolutely, if that's you, then you were about 30 years ahead of me. (laughs) But that's how I look at things is that some of us don't mature that fast and some of us don't learn our lessons some do but for those of us who were doing things that we're not so proud of as children or teenagers we have to remember that if we're not proud of those things today then we are different people and that is not you anymore that was you that's how you showed up that was your behavior then but that's not you now That's the important piece I want you to remember going into this next segment. Be right back. We are in the final days counting down to the launch of the Safe Empowerment System for Social Anxiety. This has been quite an undertaking. I didn't realize the system would be so robust. But this is good news because of what's packed in there to help you with social anxiety. There are so many angles and techniques, including ones that I've never heard of and would never have thought of before. And these are all designed to help you minimize and sometimes even eliminate your social anxiety. Last year, I asked eight experts that have all had moderate to severe social anxiety in their lives to help me create a product that reaches almost everyone. Each one of these experts share their most effective, most valuable, and most applicable teachings. Stuff they put into their own products, courses, and other material to help those they reach. People like Dr. Bernie Sewell with IncreasingSelfWorth.com. Balanced lifestyle coach Matthew Bivens, someone you may have heard on this show on occasion with the Having It All podcast. Anxiety coach Tasha McLaren at TashaMcLaren.com and a bunch of other experts and previous anxiety sufferers who have found a way out and have contributed their time and knowledge to this system to help you relieve your social anxiety too. And of course, my insights, techniques, and suggestions are all strewn throughout. And you'll hear me walk you through many of the processes to help you get to a better place. You listen to podcasts, so it was decided that the Safe Empowerment System was going to be created as an audio program crafted specifically to not only be educational, but also meditative and hypnotic. That doesn't mean the whole thing is slow and plodding. In fact, the system is set up to mix many elements. For example, the learning pods are 20 to 30 minute educational segments that mix in visualizations, subliminal conditioning, and a bunch of meditative elements. The learning pods are specifically designed to alter your state of mind to help you learn these techniques faster and repattern old anxiety and transform it into new ways of thinking and being. And these are meant to listen to over and over again so that you can continue to forge new behavior into your subconscious mind. Then you have the emergency pods that you play during an anxiety moment. As soon as you start feeling anxiety, slip away from the crowd and play an emergency pod through your phone or mp3 player to help you get through that moment minimizing the anxiety on the fly so that you aren't left standing out in the room 
feeling as if you are completely without support or a comforting voice in your ear. That's what this system becomes. It becomes that comforting voice in your ear, helping you get through the moment and helping you minimize the frequency of future moments. The emergency pods are unique in that they are short, effective, and have one goal of helping you through the moment of anxiety while it's happening. Like I said, it's a robust system and like nothing I've ever come across in all my years of coaching. I've received so many messages about social anxiety and found so much information online, but a lot of it was the same old stuff we're all used to seeing. And though a lot of it is useful and helpful, it doesn't always include the deeper level changes so many are looking for. The safe empowerment system is designed to help you create deeper level changes that guide you to more confidence, more security, less fear, and less feelings of awkwardness. All so you can start enjoying yourself and living life the way you want instead of trying to avoid so many opportunities. Stop missing opportunities. Visit quietbegins.com and see if the safe empowerment system for social anxiety is right for you. I want social anxiety to be a thing of the past, and I know you do too. Quietbegins.com. Pre-order today. The safe system launches on March 31st, 2019. All right, you remember what I said, right? That's not you now. That person from the past, that child or teenager or 20-something-year-old, how you showed up then isn't you now. Unless you haven't learned the lessons. Unless you are still doing the things that you weren't proud of then. There's very few of us that actually do that. If you aren't proud of something that you did and you change that behavior and you don't do it again, then you have, in my opinion, evolved. You are not that person anymore. You can't look back and go, oh, I'm such a bad person for doing that. I wouldn't allow that. <laughs> you can do it if you want. But I wouldn't allow that, at least for me. I couldn't allow that for me to look back and go, gee, you know, when I was 18 and I broke that guy's window on purpose or I poured that stuff into that guy's gas tank and his car broke down, I must be a bad person because of that. I really can't do that anymore because I'm not that person anymore. I did that behavior and at the time when I finally learned my lesson and said to myself, you know, that's probably not healthy behavior. That's probably not moral or ethical or definitely legal behavior. That's probably not how I want to show up in the world. That's probably not how I want to be remembered when people think of me, oh, remember Paul, he used to do all this criminal activity. I wasn't a huge criminal. <laughs> I just did some very typical young teenager exploring the world and not caring too much who I hurt kind of stuff. I shouldn't say typical. Not all teenagers are like that. I should put more stereotypical. Well, he's a young guy. He's going to break windows. That's what the young guys do. That's stereotypical. I was that guy. And I only did things like that just infrequently. But I look back and go, I never want to be that person again. Well, that's okay because I can't be because I have changed my ways many, many years ago. So I can look back and say, I'm not that person anymore. Just like you can look back at your history and think about the stuff you did. And I, I give you permission to feel not bad anymore about the stuff you did, because unless you're still doing it, you're not that person anymore. Again, that's my point. You're not that person person. And this is what's leading to this email today. I'm not going to give you the whole thing. I'm going to read you some segments of it. This person I'm going to call Scott said that recently I learned that my wife cheated on me, but I did cheat on her first. Here's the problem though. I cheated on her after we had been together for just a few weeks. It was way back in the late nineties and we were both teenagers. However, my wife just told me that she cheated on me about a year into our relationship. And um, this blew my mind. I didn't know this happened. And I figured out that basically the love of my life had a second boyfriend in our second year of dating. And then he, he goes on to say, before you judge me, understand that I have yelled at myself about being upset about this because it's been so many years. It was over 20 years ago. 
I've said things like, come on, it was almost 20 years ago. She loves you. You cheated first anyway. You're acting like a child. You're going to ruin your life. These are all the things that Scott said to himself. But he said, no matter what I do, I can't seem to shake this. I've barely gotten through 30 minutes the entire year without a negative thought. Seriously, 30 minutes. It's safe to say that it has sent me to a level of depression. I've been to two psychiatrists and they were not helpful. They seemed like they had no clue what I was talking about and just kept saying, forgiveness, forgiveness. I've read self-help books and listened to podcasts like yours, but every day I wake up and the negative thoughts are still there. I'm really concerned at this point. I've already made things weird and done irreparable damage in the relationship. I'm looking forward to hearing your feedback. I'm really desperate to smile again. Everyone around me has noticed a change. Okay, Scott, this is a, you know, I I get where you're at. This is one of those things where when you think about the news that she told you, there's some sense of betrayal there. Even though you said, I cheated first. This is what I did. So I get that she wanted to get me back. And that was what, what else he said in the letter. I don't think I read that. But she wanted to get me back. And so she did. But I just found out about this. And I found out that even a year or two into our relationship, she had another person that she was cheating with. But he knows that it was 20 years ago. He felt bad for what he did. He never did it again. And his wife that he's been married to ever since, you know, this is a long time ago. She went through her thing too when she was young and she was younger than him and they were both teenagers. And now he can't get it out of his mind. He can't stop thinking about it. It it was like it happened yesterday and and it's just so fresh in his mind that he, he can't process it. He can't digest this information. So, you know, there's some stuff going on here. I know what it feels like because before, when I met my wife, she had a past that I was totally against. I hated it. And I I would visualize her with other people. And it drove me crazy. My own thoughts drove me crazy. But she wasn't showing up as that person from her past. She was showing up as the person she is today, or at least when I was married. She was showing up as this new person woman that wasn't that old little girl or little woman, however you want to look at it. And you already know what I'm going to say is that your wife, Scott, is not the same person she was. Because I guarantee you, if she was that same person, you wouldn't stick around. Or at least if you stuck around, you would be a lot more miserable. Because you can look at this person and think, Would she ever do this to me again? I mean, ask that question. Would she ever do this to me again? Because if you answer, well, I think she would, then this has nothing to do with anything but trust. And you need to work on that. You need to tell her, look, I don't trust you. That may not be a conversation that goes over well. It may end up being, what? You don't trust me after 20 years? What? But knowing that this person isn't that same person she was, I mean, let's just pretend that she had a metamorphosis and her soul was switched with someone else's soul and now you had that person from that point on. Let's just kind of play with this. The person that she was was no longer there and there was a new person, a new and improved wife, if you want to look at it that way. Uh, Now I have this new and improved person in my life. When you think about that, does it change your thoughts? Or do you go, yeah, but uh, that body uh, was with someone else. Or do you go, who she was isn't the same, so I don't expect the same behavior, and that makes me feel better. This is the kind of metamorphosis that we go through. It really does feel like I have a different soul. I mean, maybe not that deep, maybe not that spiritual, but I certainly have a different value system, a different belief system, different outlook on life, different perceptions. I have compassion, I have empathy, I have so many things that have matured over the years that I could never show up as that old person again. Showing up as that old person again would make me sick. I could not be able to do that again. I couldn't be able to show up as that person again because it would make me ill. I guarantee you that if you and your wife have been together all this time, the person that she's showing up as today is the person that you're with, not the teenager that you were with. That was a different person. She's an entirely different person. It's almost like seeing someone else cause a problem in your life and blaming the person that you're with instead of that someone else. 
I'm serious. It is almost like that. And again, if she's doing the same behavior today, then that's the behavior you act upon and react upon. But if you know she hasn't done that behavior since, and she's shown up as the loving, devoted, or whatever supporting wife that she's always been, then what you're doing is seeing someone that she isn't and only seeing her for a time in life that she was a completely different person, just like you were a different person. I mean, think about like um, if you ever wanted a tattoo in your past. <laughs> if you get a tattoo when you're in your teen years, you might regret it when you're two years later. <laughs> you might regret it just not too long later when you go, you know, when I got that skull with the, my girlfriend's name on it, I didn't realize I was going to break up with her six months later and that I don't even like skulls anymore because they're too dark and working at the daycare kind of makes the parents feel a little weird around me when they see the skull on a girl's, you know, <laughs> it, I'm not making fun of anyone that has any type of tattoo, but I'm saying our tastes and our values and our decisions are a lot different back then because we are different people. So I'm just going to emphasize this one last time. Scott, she was a different person. Who you're talking to today is not her. And if you believe that it still is her, then you need to make the decision for yourself instead of giving her a hard time to say to yourself, wow, I think she is still the same person and I don't want to be with her anymore. So I need to take steps in order to honor myself because I still think she's the same person. That's tough. You have kids. You didn't, I didn't read that in the email too, but you do have kids. And so that doesn't make leaving easy. It makes it difficult. It makes it more challenging. But if you're serious, if you can't go 30 minutes without thinking about that thing the other person did, not your wife, you wouldn't have married someone who does that. You married someone who doesn't do that. That's why you got married, because she's not that person. But now you find out this new information, and you think she is that person, even though you know she's not. And I know you're fighting your own rationality with this. You even said to me, I've been yelling at myself. It was almost 20 years ago. She loves you. You cheated first anyway. Why am I acting like a child? Because you are thinking about it from the child's perspective when you were that age. Who are you now? What do you want for your life? What do you want for your future? Do you want this woman in your life? Let me go a little bit dark here. <laughs> I'm going to go a little bit dark in a way that helps you prioritize what's most important to you. Let's just say that your wife came up to you and she said, look, you've given me a hard time. I'm packing up tomorrow. I am moving away and I never want to be with you again because you're ridiculous. I can't handle it anymore. You're on your own. Grow up. I'm out of here. Let's say that she said that to you. I mean, really visualize that happening. I'm going to pack up tomorrow. I'm out of here. I can't stand it anymore. Really put yourself in that place. Because what you're going to find out is what's most important to you. And when you do this exercise, your brain has a tendency to change in ways that are in your highest interest. It may sound a little strange, but when you put that type of showstopper in, that you have no choice but to accept what's happening now, when you give yourself no other option but the worst case scenario, and that's not even the worst case scenario, but let's just throw that out there. I'm leaving tomorrow. I am packing up. You are so ridiculous. You are being a child just like you say to yourself, and I can't stand this anymore. Goodbye. How does this make you feel? Where does your mind go with this? Scott, or anyone else going through this, I want you to stop this recording right now and really envision that happening because your brain is going to transform a little bit here. Your brain is going to come up with new priorities. All of this is going to start sinking in. And you're going to make a decision. Just stop the recording now and go through that process. Now I'm going to assume that whoever is going through this exercise has stopped the recording and has come back and has a realization of some sort. I could be just guessing here, but there's usually a realization. There's usually some sort of enlightening thought 
a new prioritization in your mind that helps you consider things to the point where what used to plague your thoughts no longer does. And let me give you an example of that. And if you've listened for a while, you've heard me say this. After my wife and I separated with the hope of working and improving on ourselves and getting back together, after she left, I had an opportunity to be with my own thoughts for the first time in many, many years about my marriage and about how I was making her unhappy. I wasn't being supportive. I was being, in many ways, emotionally abusive, highly judgmental. I was making her life miserable, and she was losing her zest for life. She was losing her passion. And at the time, before we separated, I thought it was her. Oh, she's going to go find herself. That was my thought. But when I was in my own thoughts, without anyone else's influences, I was just sitting there in my own space. The thoughts about my judgments about her behaviors, because I was, at the time, really emotionally triggered by her emotional eating, and I was giving her so much grief about it. And she was already dealing with that challenge on her own, and I was compounding that challenge for her by being not supportive and being against her emotional eating, which caused her to emotionally eat more. These are all things in hindsight that I know now, but back then, I thought guilting her and making her feel bad about herself were the ways to help her stop. Dumb idea. (laughs) But that's what I did. And uh, when we were separated, I asked myself the question, I I have no idea where it came from, if you have such a problem with her emotional eating, why don't you just leave? That question came to me. That was like, I'm asking myself this question. Why don't I just leave? Why don't I just get a divorce? And I'd never considered that before. I'd never thought about that. My goal was to control her. My goal was to change her. I wanted to change her behavior to suit me. And I realized how pompous and arrogant that was. And I'm thinking, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be that pretentious jerk that controls the people he loves. These thoughts didn't come to mind until we were separated. This is why sometimes I encourage separation so that you can have your own thoughts without the influence of the other person around. And when I went through that and I asked myself that question, well, why don't you just leave her? If she really bothers you that much and you trying to change her makes her feel like crap and and she's never going to stop emotional eating because I had to put that in my mind too. She's never going to stop ever. Just like Scott's wife will never be able to change her past. She's a different person, but she can't change what happened. Just like I can't change my wife's behavior because I tried for many years. Then why don't I just leave? And I gave myself that show-stopping question. I gave myself that type of black and white logic. Why don't I just leave? And boy, my brain went through some shifts. I went through a transformation I can't even describe to you because it was the first time I visited that possibility because I didn't want to visit that possibility because, of course, I didn't want to get a divorce. I just wanted her to be different. But to present that type of question shifted me in a big way. In fact, it was so big that I was able to drop about 98% of how I judged my wife. I still had some small judgments. I still had some old emotional triggers in there, but almost in a, a day turnaround, I was able to look at her differently for the first time. I was able to look at her with compassion and empathize with her challenge and try her shoes on for once. I tried her on in my mind. What would it feel like to be her? And suddenly I saw this real jerk glaring at me, which was me. I saw me pretending to be my wife in my mind, saw this guy, the one that's supposed to love and support and cherish me and want me to be happy, coming at me like this judgmental I just want to swear, a hole. I'm just, I see this guy doing all of the opposite things that a loving, supporting, nurturing husband should do. Whoa. I mean, that changed my life. That changed who I was in that moment, too. A powerful, powerful moment. I, it still brings up feelings of not feeling bad about it, but feeling so good that I discovered that in myself. This is the kind of discovery, this is the kind of shift, this is the kind of event that sometimes needs to happen 
to stop those thoughts, to stop the continuous stream of negative thoughts that comes at you. And for Scott, who keeps thinking about this, he can't go 30 minutes without thinking about this. You need to give yourself that kind of black and white logic, that deal breaker comment that says, I should just get a divorce. Or she comes to you and says, I want a divorce. This is ridiculous. You need to put yourself in that place where the worst case scenario or up to it is happening now. Or how about a little darker? I said this is going to be dark. I want to go a little darker. Darker would be, oh no, my wife has um, a terminal disease and she has four months to live. That's it. Four months. You've had it checked out by six different specialists. She has four months to live. Is that thing she did when she was 17 or 18 so damn important that you've got to continue stewing over it? Is it? I'm not trying to give you a hard time. I'm saying this out of love and respect for you and your plight, your challenge. I've been there. I know what it's like. I've thought about my previous girlfriend's past and I've been upset and I can't stop thinking about it until I reach the place of some sort of ultimatum that I give to myself. Why don't I just leave? What if she's going to die in four months? What do I feel about it then? This is really next level, push your brain to the limit stuff. <laughs> as far as personal growth, as far as evolving who you are, as far as getting beyond where you are with this. Because if you aren't able to get beyond this, you're going to destroy everything that you love. It just happens. And I think you know this, Scott. I think you know that this is destroying you. You're getting depressed. There's all kinds of things happening because of this. But it's about time you just brought up some really awful worst case scenario thing and said, if this happened, then what? Is that thing that that other person did, not my wife, the person she was before she was my wife and hasn't been since, is that so important that I need to continue thinking about it or am I losing precious time here? Because if I look at it as she's dying in four months, I think my brain's going to do something. It's going to shift into what it needs to think about instead of what I keep thinking about. Because I know what you're going through. These are thoughts that just keep popping up. You have an issue with it. But she's not the same person. So you can't look at her that way anymore. That's a different person. Feel free to judge that old her all you want. I'm not taking that away from you. That old version of her, absolutely. Feel free to judge and in your mind's eye, call her B-I-T-C-A. I mean, you can do anything you want in your mind's eye with that old version of her. But this new version of her, she doesn't deserve that. She doesn't deserve that treatment because that's not her. And like I said before, if it was, you wouldn't be together. Because you don't, you don't want that type of person in your life. You want her in your life. So you really have to separate the old person that did that behavior with this new person that doesn't do that behavior. It's a different person. You'd be like finding two people on the street. One of them punches you in the face and the other one helps you off the ground. But you blame the one that helps you off the ground for punching you in the face. Even though they're two different people. It has to be that separate in your mind. It has to be that different. So introduce these elements into your inner dialogue so that you can finally get to a new place. And I'm giving you a way out too. If you can't come to a new place, then really come to that final last straw and say, well, if I can't handle this, then I should leave instead of giving her all this grief. Because when you really think about it that way, some major shift is going to happen. For me, when I said that, I realized, oh my God, I don't want to lose all these years of marriage. What am I thinking? I, I don't want to leave. I don't want to get a divorce. If this is going to change, I'm going to have to change. And it wasn't just saying it. It was feeling it. It was transforming with it. And even if I decided, well, yeah, I don't like this behavior and I'm going to get out now, then that still would have been better than giving her any more years of the grief I gave her. I'm just putting this out there for you. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you for that message, Scott. I hope this helps anyone that's listening. It's going through a similar experience or has gone through a similar experience. You will get beyond this. You will move past this. You're going to do it one way or the other. It's going to happen. We'll be right back.
Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. A reminder, go to quietbegins.com and check out this safe empowerment system for social anxiety. It may be exactly what you need. Quietbegins.com And also, if you're subscribed to this show, you've probably already heard the episode when you're constantly defending yourself, and that is an emotional abuse tactic that uh, certain people will do in your life to keep you on the defense so that you stay focused on yourself instead of the bad behavior they're doing. It is a very, very common tactic, and it's something that you need to know about. If you haven't heard it yet, it's over at loveandabuse.com, and I also put that episode on this feed with some extra commentary as far as some things I wanted to mention as well. But check out loveandabuse.com, the podcast. It is based on the mean workbook on emotional abuse and manipulation, and it is not just for romantic relationships. It's for any person in your life that is communicating in a poisonous way or showing up with toxic behavior or lying or manipulating or just trying to con you in some way, these people, you know, I look at them as emotional predators. They just want to abduct your good emotions and just leave you with the bad ones. And I don't want that for you. So I've come out with a podcast that really educates you and gets you prepared for people like that so that you know that you're not alone in this and you're not going crazy. This is probably actually happening to you. And the Love and Abuse podcast clues you in as to what's going on over at loveandabuse.com. Also, you'll find the mean workbook there that gives you an assessment of your relationship and helps you learn how to heal through a difficult situation that you're in. And to be honest, that's the biggest seller on my website. I mean, I get so much feedback on the mean workbook of people telling me how it has helped them, saved them, healed them. So many good words, so many encouraging words, so many inspirational stories that I keep receiving because they got this workbook and were able to pinpoint what's going on in their relationship, especially because of the uh, 200 point assessment in there. So check it out, loveandabuse.com, both the mean workbook and the podcast are over there too. And I want to thank two new patron members, Sammy and Molly or Mal. I'm so sorry. I don't know how to pronounce your name, but I am so glad that you're on the patron program helping to support this show. That is exactly how this show continues. Our patrons like you that show your support and keep this show going and keep the information going out into the world. If you find what I talk about here valuable to you, head over to patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com and show your support. You can do a monthly donation or a single donation. It's totally up to you. And of course, if you join the patron program, you get all the private episodes and workbooks and worksheets and a PDF copy of the, the Overwhelmed Brain book and a few other things too. So I like to give back as much as I possibly can. And um, it's my way of saying thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. And anyone that uses the Amazon link at theoverwhelmedbrain.com and of course the donate link, I am honored and appreciate you. Thank you so much. And finally, I'd like to thank Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in the overwhelmed brain. And just a quick comment on the, the multiple emails that I receive almost daily Uh, They have been building up for the past year. Yes, I have emails that go back one year. If you think I'm ignoring you, I'm not. Every single one of these is in my inbox. Every single one. If I haven't written back to you, it's because it's either still there or it has become an episode. And if you are a regular listener, you may have heard your email on the air, at least a part of it, like I read today, parts of emails. The email I read today, several months, maybe up to a year old. And so these people that I'm talking about may have gone through some sort of shift already or unfortunately, quite often what happens is that nothing has changed. And sometimes things have gotten worse. You know, I can't get to the emails right away and I'm not saying I'm the answer man and I'm going to be able to help you and with multiple psychiatrists can't, but I do respond to every one of them eventually because in some way, shape or form, Uh, by bringing up the topic on the air or by responding directly, which is I don't do that too often responding, responding directly because I just don't have the time to do that. But if I can create an episode on the topic, I absolutely will. And that's why it's, I'm going to say it's important to keep listening because if you've written and you think, oh, he's never going to read my message. Oh, it's been six months. He just forgot about me. What a jerk. You know, if you think that it's not true, I, I still have it in my inbox And I realize things may have changed for you, but 
the messages that you send me are important and I want to get them out there and at least give you my insights and opinions on them just in case it helps you or anyone else through what they're going through. Just like Scott, he wrote that message today. Again, I made up that name. Uh, but you know, Scott has these thoughts that are plaguing his mind and he just can't get rid of them. What do I do? How do I get rid of these thoughts? And he may have had to continue dealing with this because he haven't, hasn't been able to find anything that helps him. I try to cover every single topic I can on this show so that you have some sort of reference. Like I said, it may not be the solution that you're looking for, but it gives you a new perspective, new ideas, hopefully a new direction to take so that you have some sort of alternate path to follow than the one you've been on. It's like when I talk about the safe system for social anxiety. There's a repatterning that sometimes needs to take place in you. And when you have obsessive thinking, that's the old record playing over and over and over again. And you get sick of that record. You, you just want to get out of it. You even know, like Scott, he even knows it's irrational. Why do I keep thinking these thoughts? And even when I don't address the email on the air, you're going to hear other ideas on this show. You're going to hear other perspectives, other techniques that I've learned or I've made up throughout the years to help you get beyond stuff. Like obsessive thinking, that is a continuous repetition of the same thoughts over and over again. Sometimes you have little tweaks. Sometimes they're worse. Sometimes they're not so bad, but they're the same outcome every time. You just feel bad. You just don't like it and you can't get past it. And one of the things that I've learned over the years is that when you have something that you think about that causes you to feel bad, angry, upset, is asking yourself, when I think about these things, do I imagine them the, the exact same way every time? For example, do I imagine that same person in the same position, uh, saying the same things in the same room at the same point in my life? with all the exact same memories that I had going on at that time. Like remembering when you were 16 and that person bullied you and it was in school right next to your locker and you remember the halls were crowded and no one was helping you. There's all kinds of variables and facets to a memory that are burned in there that keep replaying itself. I love the idea of just changing aspects of those memories so at least you're not playing the same movie over and over again. This literally can change history. I mean, that's what they call it in NLP, changing history. You can actually change the memory by changing aspects of that memory. And what I mean by that is if it happened in school and the hall was crowded with students, how about crowding the hall with beach balls instead of students? <laughs> you just change an aspect of it and instead of standing next to a locker you're standing next to uh, how about a a totem pole of garden gnomes <laughs> or something and instead of it being a 15 or 20 foot wide hall how about making it 100 feet wide how about putting windows in the ceiling so the sun's shining down you know you can still have the same memory using this example of someone bullying you in school but adding these other features changes something it changes the feeling and how about when they bully you they speak like someone that sounds like a complete idiot <laughs> i don't want to make fun of anyone in particular I, I like to use a donkey's voice <laughs> so when they start speaking i can see the donkey teeth i can hear the donkey's voice coming out and i have a different feeling this is what i like to do with obsessive thoughts is i like to change the variables, change the facets. I like to change all kinds of things, the visuals, the sounds. And by doing that, by changing different aspects of it, you know, you can paint the walls a different color. You can put, um, you can put a big goofy donkey head on the, the person that's bullying you. And suddenly the memory has a different feeling, a different effect. And as you do this, as you repeat this process over and over again and have different things going on every time, trying to get back to the original memory without having a different feeling and maybe even a laugh instead of that old nasty feeling that you, you don't like. That starts changing things for you. That starts creating a different type 
of association so that maybe, just maybe, you can go a lot longer the next time before remembering it in that same way. And maybe you can go even further than that. Instead of days, it's weeks. Instead of weeks, it's months. Instead of months, it's years. And years later, it's very hard to remember some traumatic event the same way because you've changed it so much. The brain is capable of doing this and you are capable of helping it along. You can do this. It may not help with the deepest traumatic things in the world, in your life, but why not try it? Why not? Again, remember my disclaimer at the beginning of the show, don't do anything without a psychiatrist or a mental health professional, so on and so forth. But after you get their permission, try it. See what happens. And no matter what, keep an open mind so that you can step into your power. This will help you be firm in your decisions and actions so that you can create the life you want. Always take steps to grow and evolve. You are powerful beyond measure. And above all, and this is something I absolutely know to be true about you, you are amazing.